be about searching for dark matter axions. These are axions that would make dark matter. This kind of is a nice way to start. This is a Hubble cluster image, and the, I don't know why the label doesn't show here, but each one of these uh, peaks is a galaxy, and there's obviously a mass over density where you have a galaxy, but most of the mass is actually between the galaxies in this cluster. The overwhelming amount is in the mass between the clusters. And these are yet another bit of evidence for dark matter dominating the matter, stuff that clumps gravitationally. That's what I mean by matter. Uh, this is the outline of the talk. Um, oh, how interesting. Um, quickly, what are dark matter axions? What are their current bounds? In other words, where can we constrain them? There are three flagship searches. There are probably 10 or 20 methods to search for axions. I'll just talk about three. R&D for how to move forward, new initiatives, maybe. We'll see how much time we have and, con and conclusions. Um, the problem of dark matter, as everybody knows, is not only a current problem, it's a very, very old problem. It dates to when the 1920s, when people first realized that we are in a galaxy. That realization came in the 1920s. And once we realized that our solar system was within a galaxy, the question became how did it move, what potential was it in, et cetera, et cetera, map out the motions of objects near us. So this was a most cited paper at the time, Captain's paper and it studied the motions of objects nearby in our galaxy, and he found a disturbing result. It wasn't disturbing, but he found a result that the um, amount of matter that he could infer was inconsistent with the motions, in this case the vertical motions, of stuff out of the uh, disk, and he called that discrepancy dark matter. That was the stuff that he needed to explain the motions that he didn't see. As far as I know, this is the first modern incarnation of dark matter. It dates to the 1920s, when we first realized we're in a galaxy. This was picked up by Oort in the 1930s, and uh, most of the credit, I guess because they're such interesting people, go to Zwicky and Smith in the later in the 1930s, who I won't say popularized dark matter, but this is where most people give the credit for dark matter. And they took data from Hubble and Hummison. They didn't generate their own data. And they showed that um, things like the Virgo cluster, the galaxies are buzzing around. Uh, they're well virialized, but their velocities seem to be much greater than that from the galaxies themselves. So there was a lot of matter they didn't see. The Virgo cluster should have blown up, but it was well virialized. So that's the 1930s, 1920s to 1930s. And since then, of course, dark matter came in the news. I mean, people realized that it was a serious problem. It just wasn't missing matter. It was some exotic matter. Um, it was... Um, um, probably not even part of the standard model. The inference is it's a new particle left over from the Big Bang. We aren't sure about that, but that's the inference that we have. Um, and that leads us to something called the axion. So um, the axion is a light. This is a micro EV to milli EV pseudoscalar. So the lightest standard model particle we have that has a mass is the, well, is the neutrino now. But these are even lighter than the neutrino. So the neutrino um, weighs presumably much more than that. Uh, and it would comprise the dark matter. It must have extraordinarily feeble couplings to matter and radiation. This is a requirement for dark matter. It was created in the early universe. It's still here now. It couldn't have dumped a lot of energy in the universe through decays, et cetera, et cetera. It must be remarkably stable, if not perfectly stable. And then great minds like Frank Wilczek, much higher mind, great mind than mine, uh, says that if they exist at all, axions would be produced in the universe. Excellent candidate, uh, challenging, and he thinks within 100 years, 
Oh, God, possibly much sooner they should succeed in detecting them. I hope we do it in the much sooner. So this, this is from Frank Wilczek's 100 Years in Physics, uh, Future Guesses. Um, what is an axion two? I don't want to give a theory discussion here. This is from Ann Nelson, my go-to theorist. And Ann Nelson divides the world of theories, and there are more theories than you can shake a stick at, into viable theories and natural and elegant theories. So there's the viable theories, there's the natural and elegant theories, and this is all you need to know about axions. Theories that are natural, elegant, and are viable have dark matter axions. What could be more convincing than that? Um, these are some key properties of what I call standard dark matter, axion or not. Um, it must have feeble interactions with normal matter and radiation. The dark matter in our spiral galaxy is pretty much spherical. It's got unit form factor, aspect ratio. Yet, we have a baryonic disk. If there was any interaction of the dark matter with the disk, you would eventually cool that disk in the vertical, sorry, cool the dark matter in the vertical direction. There's no evidence for that. It's very, very non-interacting. Um, it has gravitational interactions. That's the matter part of its name. It's long-lived. As I said, it's around today. It's cold. This is something I didn't mention earlier. Um, there's wonderful experiments, as you well know, looking at the microwave background, et cetera, et cetera. Those, to make sense of that, the dark matter can't smear structure on relatively small scales. We don't see that. It's not moving relativistically in the early universe when we see that structure. It's therefore there, but it's not moving relativistically. It's cold. Um, low mass axions are an ideal dark matter candidate. First of all, they're long lived. WIMPs are long lived because they're the bottom of a chain of supersymmetry and they have a convert, conserved quantum number, whatever this R parity thing is in supersymmetry, can't decay into anything lower. Axions are stable because they have a low mass. What can they decay to? They can decay to massless particles like photons, et cetera, et cetera. The phase space to do that is extraordinarily tiny. It's exquisitely tiny. So where a pion can decay into two photons, its lifetime is 10 to the minus 16 seconds. A micro EV axion, if you just scale that phase space down to a micro EV, it's 10 to the 50th years or something. Long, 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 long time. Uh, it's cold. This may be counterintuitive. Um, it's got a very low mass, and you're thinking as low mass objects have high Maxwellian speeds but you've assumed thermal equilibrium. These are produced in the early universe, presumably in a phase transition, dead cold, and they never thermalize, and more or less, they remain cold. Uh, and there's no observational evidence that I know of that favors axions over WIMPs or WIMPs over axions at this point. If there were, that'd be a wonderful result to have in your pocket. Uh, plus, the axion mass is constrained to one or two orders of magnitude. That's a good thing if you're an experimenter. Um, and the axion couplings are constrained to about an order of magnitude. This is very different from the WIMP, where the couplings have been all over the place and going down <laughs> if they're viable. Here, they can't go infinitely far down. And if you're a believer in Occam's razor, having two uh, highly motivated um, problems it addresses, the dark matter problem and this so-called strong CP problem I didn't talk about, uh, makes it very attractive. I didn't talk about where axions came from. Um, axion bounds. So axions, I first heard of axions when I was a graduate student at SLAC, and two of the theorists at SLAC at the time, Peche and Quinn, Roberto Peche and Kellen Quinn, had this idea. And the idea is they would solve the strong CP problem in the following way. The strong CP problem is an oddity. The QCD, quantum chromodynamics, the theory of the strong interaction was developed in early 1970s. When they first developed it, it appeared to be completely conserving of parity and CP and the other discrete symmetries. Um, fellow named Polyakov 
in sort of middle of the 1970s, observed that in fact, one needs to think more about that. There are objects in QCD that don't exist in QED. And he labeled them pseudoparticles, but we call them instantons. These are configurations of fields looked in the right way in the ground state of QCD. There's no analog of these in QED. In QED, it was very simple. If I ask you, what is the ground state of QED, you'd say, boy, that's simple. E equals zero, B equals zero, that's got to be the ground state. That's not the answer. Well, that is an answer in QCD, but there are infinite number of degenerate ground states. And they differ by these configurations of these instantons. These instantons, they're called instant because they appear in an instant of time and then they disappear. And um, so they wink in and wink out and they carry the quantum numbers of CP. So you have the ingredients now in the mid 1970s of CP violation and the strong interactions. People didn't want to get rid of this. So one way to deal with this and say, yeah, I don't believe it. But this whole bit of machinery allowed an understanding of light meson masses that you otherwise wouldn't have. And I will just leave it at that, that if you throw away this machinery, the meson masses that you see are kind of an accident rather than have some underlying theory. Uh, astrophysical bounds. So axions were invented then in the mid-1970s to deal with this issue that in the strong interactions, you predict substantial amounts of CP violation, but none is observed. And the discrepancy is not minor, it's 10 orders of magnitude. So by dimensional analysis, the neutron should have an electric dipole moment of around 10 to the minus 16 e centimeter, and the bounds are sort of around 10 to the minus 26 e centimeter. So there's something afoot. Peche Quinn wanted to solve that, and they did it in the modern way. They said, I will imagine that there is a new hidden symmetry of nature. That was very trendy at the time. It's a hidden axial global U1 symmetry. In other words, I can take all the quark fields and rotate them by an axial symmetry. Um, there's a problem with that. If you take all the quark fields and rotate them by an axial symmetry, you should get opposite parity hadrons, which they don't observe. So nature, for whatever reason, spontaneously breaks with symmetry. That's the second trendy thing. So it sounds a lot like Higgs physics now, for those who are experts. You get a Goldstone boson. The Goldstone boson is the axion. And Peche and Quinn observed that the terms that you get when you go through this procedure, this Peche-Quinn procedure, uh, those extra terms that you get null the CP violation. They give you an extra Goldstone boson called the axion. So people wanted to look for this axion, and this is the first astrophysical bound I found on the axion. You can see it's from 1978, so it gives you an idea when this stuff was happening. It's got some Kolbs on it and Wagoners on it. Uh, it's um, completely wrong, <laughs> but it was the first paper that came out, and since then there's been a huge industry of people looking at astrophysical bounds and putting limits on axions. This one also put a limit on the Higgs, by the way, which was completely wrong. Uh, but it was the first. This is the current set of bounds on axions, so I have to explain this plot a little bit. This is the putative axion mass, and starts at a micro EV, Where's one EV? There's one EV. Here's up to a hundred EV. This is the coupling of axion into two photons. It, it's a dimensional coupling inverse GeV. Um, I don't quite know yet where the axion mass is yet, but here's the two theory lines here. There's a so-called KSVZ theory. I won't tell you what that means in DFSZ. Um, I can say that KSVZ is completely arbitrary and ad hoc, and as far as I can tell, there's no physics behind it. DFSZ is so-called gut axion model, and gut axion model has two very simple ingredients in it. It says there is a unification group for SU3 cross SU2 cross U1. It's unified. Maybe it's e SU5, maybe it's E8. The other is that the unrenormalized sine squared theta W is 3 eighths. 
That's the only two assumptions in that model. So it's a real model. It's weaker than this other benchmark model, and that's where you want to be. You can't get much less than that, um, but that's where you want to be. Coming from couplings that are big, supernova 1987A and white dwarf, these are astrophysical bounds, white dwarf bounds, supernova bounds. If axions had couplings bigger than that in that mass range, they would have produced detectable results, outcomes. In the case of supernova, you would have seen a dispersion in the arrival of the neutrino pulse from supernova 1987A. For the case of the white dwarf bound, axions would provide another cooling channel and the so-called luminosity function of the white dwarfs would be altered. And they're crudely within a factor of two about the same. So for, if the axion is the dark matter, exists, it has to be below this line. Um, if the axion were much heavier than around 10 to the minus 3 milli electron volt, you would have started to detect it in astrophysical contexts. So there is a narrow bound here from about 10 to the minus 6 to 10 to the minus 3 that the axion could live in mass. It has to live somewhere in this bound. So it's a very relatively constrained search region for an experimenter to look for dark matter axions. These are a bunch of experiments that don't matter. This is something called the microwave cavity experiments. This is, um, the purple is data that's already been taken and blue is some concept of where we're going and we'll go into more detail on that. It's interesting that what I see here is different than there, but we will move on. Um, so there's a good question you could ask, how solid are these constraints? They're escape hatches galore. That's all I can say. They're not airtight. But I'll focus, as I said, on these three classes of experiment. Um, let me start with one that I love. It's the one that I'm working on. Um, this is conceptually a very, very simple experiment where CMS has a million channels or something we have one. Um, so the axion couples, I said, very weakly to normal particles. And uh, if you had a micro EV mass axion, boy, there are a lot in this room. Because the amount of dark matter in this room is about a proton mass per cc. This thing weighs a micro EV. There's 10 to the 13th per cc in this room. Those things have a lifetime of something like 10 to the 50th seconds. Uh, and it happens that this coupling of axion, here's the axion of two photons, I have a little blob there, has very little model dependence. It's a great process. I'm not going to go into the reason why. Other processes involving the axion would have model dependence, a lot of it, but this one doesn't. Um, so that's the process that we're looking at, axion coupling into two photons. So it kind of looks like the very low mass version of the neutral pion. And this is how you convert that into a search. It's really quite straightforward. Here you have a nearby axion. In fact, we have 10 to the 13th or so per cc. So there's a lot of nearby axions. Here's a um, magnet coil. That's the purple. It provides a vertical magnetic field of around 8.5 tesla. Um, a nearby axion scatters off a virtual photon in that field, a zero energy photon in that field. And out pops a real photon carrying almost the entire mass of that axion. The mass is micro EV. That photon is a microwave photon. Very low energy photon, because it's a very low mass axion. And this is supposed to represent uh, taking the energy out of the cavity with some state of the art amplifiers. So um, the frequency of that one photon is equal to the total energy of the axion, that is to say its mass. And the critical parameter for this is the system noise temp temperature. If you double the system noise temperature, you quadruple the amount of time it takes you to reach a certain signal noise ratio. If you use transistor amplifiers, it would take you many, many, many centuries to do our experiment. So they just wouldn't work for us. 
But here's a little picture of what we'd like to see. If this is the spectral density we look at in the cavity, here's a bump of order 10 to the minus 6 wide in frequency, and that's kind of a threshold axion. That's what it would look like in our experiment. Um, and as I said, the search rate has a noise temperature squared. So getting the search rate sensible requires having a very low um, system noise. Yeah, so, oh, thank you for reminding me. I forgot to mention one other thing that's absolutely crucial. I surround the volume, and thank you, with a resonant cavity. That's what narrow bands it. Um, and the reason I do that is the Q of the cavity improves the rate for this process by Q. And the price you pay is what he just said. Namely, instead of a broadband search, I now have a narrow band search. It's the axions convert around the resonant frequency of the cavity, but not off re resonance. So thank you very, very much. Um, so this is sort of the realization of the experiment. We're a collaboration with a bunch of institutions. Um, won't go into details. We are one of the three Gen 2 dark matter experiments. We're the tiny one in the Gen 2 portfolio uh, relative to the one you heard about from Harry Nelson. Um, they're about a factor of 10 more in dollars than we are. Um, this is a cartoon of the little bit. <laughs> the, so the experiment is four or five meters tall. And uh, here's the cryostat for the experiment. Here are the superconducting magnet coils. And here is the insert here. Here's the microwave cavity here. Um, the amplifiers are not transistor amplifiers. They are quantum amplifiers. They they're work on Josephson junctions. There's no classical analog of these. They provide very, very low noise. Um, so we regularly operate the quantum noise at one gigahertz is around 50 milliEV. The best transistor amplifier you can buy on the market, if you cool in liquid helium, is around five, six, seven. Um, the amplifier you use for your satellite TV is probably 20, 30 K, and we're 100 millikelvin or less. So we really have low noise amplifiers. The quantum electronics have, can't sit in a magnetic field, so we actually have a bucking coil that bucks the main magnet field, which is an engineering tour de force in itself. And then the signal comes out of this big thing and goes out to an experiment. This is the Krausstadt being commissioned in Seattle, and you can see a couple things. One is there's this appendectomy scar where the persistent switch failed and blew out the side of the cryostat. That was, that was extremely interesting. And that's the re-weld and rework that you can see there. The other is it's powered up now. This was a test of the thing sitting on the floor. These magnet leads are being yanked uh, apart for obvious reasons. Um, if you look carefully, you can see me mapping the field lines with wrenches here. You can see the dipole field lines. And apparently, the high magnetic field makes you lose your hair. That's another outcome. But darn it, it's worth it. <laughs> right. Um, pardon? We need to do a Primakov. Who, 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 who asked that? Great. We need to do a Primakov-like process. So it's very common for people to go to Slack, take a pi knot slam it into a target, and out comes a photon. What's going on is the nuclear potential is sending a photon into this blob, and out comes the other one. In this case, the potential is the magnet. Okay, So it's inverse Primakov production with a cylindrical potential. Um, what am I thinking? This is typical quantum electronics. This is physical temperature of the electronics. This is its noise temperature. Here's the quantum limit. Oh, sorry, here's the quantum limit. And you can see, blah, 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 we're pretty cold. Um, this is just kind of fun. If we take many, many, many averages, we, the relative fluctuations in the noise fall as square root number of averages till we integrate for about a month. And we're down to something like um, 10 to the, where there we are, a hundredth of a yakta watt. So I have seen experiments that are sensitive to yakta something. 
our latest running is we actually are running out of SI prefixes. We're actually 10 to the minus 3 of the octawa. We need another prefix. Um, that's just kind of cute. And this is sensitivity, by the way, is something like a thousandth of a DFSE, even the more pessimistic axion. We read out more than one mode. I said there's one channel. There's actually two channels per cavity. The lowest TM mode of the cavity, the TM010, has the best overlap of um, the B field with the E field. The axion has to convert into a pseudoscalar. So E dot B integrated over the cavity volume better be non-zero. That's the pseudoscalar quantity you make out of these two. The lowest TM mode has an E field, which is <laughs> straight up and down. It's the most propitious to give you this overlap integral. The next mode isn't bad, right? So the next mode, you have to imagine, as you go radially out, it does this, has an extra zero. You lose a little bit, but you still have a non-zero amount. So we take those two channels, and um, these are the two models, and you really want to be down here, and you can see we lose a little bit on the higher channel there. And these are some pretty pictures of the inside of the cavity. It's copper, et cetera, et cetera. I should add, also add that in front of our quantum amplifiers, there are filters, superconducting filters, which reject out-of-band power, and they have otherwise they have beautiful properties. They have unit transmission, essentially, and they have unit rejection and no loss. So they're also crucial to our experiment. Uh, this is more pretty pictures. Uh, there's a uh, high-frequency cavity that operates in parallel. So here's the main cavity. There's a little cavity called the sidecar cavity. And this is essentially to go to higher frequency, but also as a test bed for our technologies we're going to use on the big cavity. So we're kind of like NASA in that we have, we have to operate the experiment for a long time. It's very painful to get into it, et cetera, et cetera. So the way we commission parts is we put it on the small cavity, and then if it works in production, it goes into the new baseline. Um, we call it the sidecar cavity. And the, what was going on here at the time is we have little piezoelectric motors that adjust the coupling. Uh, so there's, uh, there's a vertical motor, and there's a rotary motor here. And that's what was being tested at the time. This also gives us reasonable but not great sensitivity at higher frequencies. The frequency depends on the radius of the cavity. Um, this is a picture of the experiment going in and out of the bore. Here's it going into the magnet bore. You don't really see much here. Here's the top plate of the cavity, and the real estate is pretty packed up on top. Uh, and all you see here are thermal shields and a helium reservoir. Here it is coming out, and it's just a pretty picture of this thing, and all you see are thermal shield, helium reservoir, thermal shield. You don't really see the experiment there. But it gives you an idea of rigging this in and out. Um, this is only for experts. I'm, um, probably I shouldn't say much about it, except it is a dilution refrigerator cooled experiment. Once you say you're at 100 millikelvin, there aren't a lot of technologies that give you lots of cooling power at 100 millikelvin. You're at a dilution fridge, and we turn it on, and this sort of tells you when we reach our base temperature. And there's just a picture of our dill fridge. It is a big, big dill fridge by laboratory standards. That's all I can say. And we have a crew that takes care of it. Um, this is, which channel is this? This would be the higher frequency channel. And this is a fake axion. Oh, I should mention something about this experiment as well. Calibrations. At the very bottom of this cavity, there's a very, very, very weakly coupled port. We can synthetically inject an RF signal that mimics the amplitude and line shape of the axion. Those go through our analysis chain, and they better appear as candidates. This would be an example of a few hundred times, I think, a typical axion line. But this is what got injected too much power into the bottom of the cavity. So an experiment like CDMS or LZ that you heard about, they calibrate their experiment essentially um, with radioactive sources and neutron beams, et cetera. But in operation, it just operates. In our experiment, during operation, we inject signals. 
all the way from one end of the chain all the way to the other end of the chain. And we have a whole discussion, which I don't have time for, on our ladder of calibration for our noise temperature. That's crucial. But that's sort of what a signal would look like multiplied by a couple hundred. Um, this is just a couple days scanning. There's not a lot of information content here. This is from um, some last year, probably. You can see low frequency, medium frequency, high frequency. So each cavity has two modes, and this is lowest mode, small cavity, small cavity. Um, there's not a lot to see in these curves, except that each, each day we scan units sort of of megahertz per day in our scanning. Um, this is where we'd like to be. We started 2016. This has now shifted somewhat. We had some issues. Uh, this has shifted somewhat. I actually don't quite know how much yet. But we are studying the frequency, scanning the frequency range in blocks of frequency. And these frequencies correspond to major changes in the cavity system and the electronics. We have to pull it out. We have to reconfigure it. That's, that's what, what each of these blocks mean. Uh, so we're currently scanning at uh, better, presumably, than even the, the more pessimistic coupling, which I actually think is the most reasonable one. And again, this is the model range. And you want to be kind of in this region here. So we're in the sweet spot of where you want to be for dark matter axions, and we're starting to scan this. And you can see we have a multi-year program ahead of us. And since we've pushed this now up by six months plus, we have to push this up by six months plus, which delights our program officer. Um, so there are other people doing this. There's no other people doing this with big volume at high sensitivity yet. Um, I think what they're hoping for is they have a breakthrough in R&D, either in receiver technology, maybe squeeze states, maybe high Q coatings that survive the magnetic field. Um, but there are people at, uh, in this case, Yale, et cetera, working on a very small thing. This thing is that big. So it's not going to reach great sensitivity, but they're using it as a platform for exotic R&D, hope, hoping for a breakthrough. Um, extreme, <laughs> so I won't go into their details. Um, Korea, so Korea, as one of their science technology centers, they've dumped a lot of money into a, a Korean science institute that's working on a proton EDM machine, which I don't quite understand. and and. RF cavity axion search. So they're just starting this. Um, I won't go into lots of details. I, I don't have actually a lot of details. They've been at it for a while, but I don't have a lot of details. But they're going to have big magnets, several of them, perhaps. They're also going to use quantum electronics. And there's some pictures of concrete being broken and stands getting ready for dilution refrigerators. Um, fine. Um, ooh, ooh. Um, Gen 3 and beyond. So if we don't find the axion, all I want to say is that the push forward seems to be on single photon detection, which radically changes the experiment. It's, so far, it's been a laboratory curiosity. If it makes the transition to a, a real tool in a laboratory, then it would have great implications on our experiment. And also, quantum amplifiers that go to higher frequency, um, that problem has been solved in the last year. So Josephson parametric amplifiers for the experts have now gone up to 10, 20, 30 gigahertz. Um, low frequency. You can push the technology to low frequencies very, very simply. Um, if you just take a normal flat end cap of a cavity and pattern it, make it reactive, you slow down the velocity in the transverse direction, just like in, at a slack linear accelerator. By putting reactive disks in, you slow down the phase velocity in the longitudinal direction. You can do the same thing in the trans transverse direction. And you can make the cavity look electrically bigger. 
So going to low frequency is actually not that hard, and part of our program is to do that, to try and catch up on the low frequency end, that is below a micro EV by somewhat. Um, there is an idea called the LC detector, which uh, other people are looking at, and the idea is you put a loop in the cavity, and there's a bit of quantum axion electrodynamics that says the effect of this time-varying field in space, coupled with a magnetic field, has the effect of inducing a pseudo B field. It's not a real B field, that is time-varying and goes through the loop. So to say that again, the time-varying axion field coupled with this vertical B field that you apply produces a pseudo B field that can be a Faraday-like source in a, in a loop. And there it is time-varying axion field, B field, blah, blah, blah. And you can detect that. That's gotten some attention. Um, and we'll see how it goes. There will be experiments based on this. Their sensitivity is much lower frequency. And we'll see where that goes. Um, much higher frequencies, you'll notice in the plot of the ADMX sensitivity, it goes up to around 40 micro EV. And you really like to go up one more order of magnitude to close out the search space. And it's hard to do that when the size of the wavelength in free space is really, really small. And you've got cavities that are macroscopic. So all I can say is there are ideas, and this is one of them, uh, to synthesize a spatially varying magnetic field and build up an electromagnetic field from axion decays, in this case in the walls, in, in the middle of a Fabry Perot resonator. Um, this is a very tough game. You can try and adapt so-called photonic band gap cavities to the microwave. It is very, very challenging. That's, that's all I can say. Um, solar axion search, sur searches. Um, this is the second um, flagship project. Um, it's pushed mostly by CERN, not by the United States. And the idea of it is very, very simple. The sun spits off. So there's nuclei in the sun. There's a hot, it's hot. There's a gamma, there, there is a photon. Out spits a gamma ray. Gamma ray makes it all the way to the Earth. You take a LHC dipole. You point the bore of the dipole at the sun. You reverse this process, essentially, that uh, it's not this process, axion and two photon process. And out, since the sun is hot, uh, these axions are hot, even though they're low mass, so they're KEV-ish. So you're making x-rays here. This is an x-ray. And this is the first version of this called the Axion Solar Telescope. So it's on an alt as mount, and it looks for axions. And of course, you have to focus the x-rays, so it has state-of-the-art astrophysics optics, x-ray optics, grazing incidence optics. And it has sort of state-of-the-art uh, x-ray sensors at the focal point as well. So um, kind of an interesting thing. Um, I won't go into details, except it hasn't really gone down much into the, you'd really like to be down here. Imagine this curve continuing. You'd really like to be, as I was going to say, down here. They're kind of up here, maybe a little better at this point. Um, their path forward is CERN has an R&D program called IAXO, the International Axion X-ray Observatory. This is no longer an old LHC, a spare LHC dipole. This is a dedicated magnet. Um, it has many magnet bores, so it looks like a shotgun approach here, many magnet bores. Um, higher magnetic field, better this and better that. Uh, CERN and I actually disagree on the cost of this magnet. So I have my own costing. Crudely speaking, cryomagnet technology, by the time you deploy it in an experiment, is roughly a million dollars a ton. This is one of those rough things. And this, the cost that CERN has is much less than a million dollars a ton. So we'll see. But this is not yet approved. It's still in the R&D stage. It's a, it's a very expensive 
regardless of my disagreement with CERN, it's still a very expensive project. Um, again, it's state-of-the-art optics uh, built on sort of state-of-the-art astrophysical experiments. Um, I won't go into their sensitivity prospects. Um, let me talk about the final flagship search. This is another European project, but it's mostly now driven by DESI um, at this point. Uh, the idea is very, very simple. You take a laser um, and um, where's the magnet here? This is, this is, color's not showing up here. This is the magnet here. So imagine a vertical magnetic field. It's a dipole. Laser comes in, converts it to axions, some of them. There's an axion to photon coupling. You block the laser light. Then you reconvert it with another magnet. Okay. Um, then you detect the photons when you reconvert it. Um, this was an experiment at Fermilab called GAM-V, and it ran for a number of years, and it wasn't hugely sensitive. Uh, but there is a, and so it kind of laid fallow for a little bit, and I won't go into details, but there was a new thinking on these experiments. The new thinking is you put, so here's the, where you make the axions, here's where you convert them, and here's the brick wall. On each space here, you put Fabry Perot resonators and you phase lock the two Fabry Perots. And maybe if you're lucky, you can get finesses of a million, million bounces in that Fabry Perot. You phase lock the two Fabry Perots. So you need some probe light and you need to phase, phase lock it. Um, the rate of axion to detection goes up by the square of the finesse, and the sensitivity goes as the square root of that. So this is potentially a, now a very sensitive search, putting in these phase-locked Fabry Perot's. Um, this is ELPS2. ELP is any light particle, and two is the second iteration of it with Fabry Perot mirrors. This is going into the old tunnel there and using the Hera magnets. For the magnet string, 20 magnets, 10 plus 10 is the string for this. It's a very challenging experiment. For one thing, when you think about it, ring magnets at Hera have to be bent, and they have to unbend the magnets. And they don't open them up. They literally put a tooling in there and bend it. So it's, it's, it's a challenge. But that's what they're going to do. And the idea is, of course, you uh, have one set of magnets here providing this B, another set here, and make an axion, go through the brick wall, another axion. It's not quite so simple. Um, that is the next flagship project. Um, the optics are crucial for this. And there's now a new group from Florida working on optics with Hanover. They have the laser centrum and University of Hanover there. Uh, the detector is um, a very interesting detector. It's a pin diode array. Uh, uh, sorry, I just said pin diode. I'm wrong experiment. Transition edge sensor array that uh, is almost commercial. Magnets are from DESI. Funding is DESI. Little bit of NSF in the US, Heising Simons, and Germany. Um, the goals are they would like to move down here somewhere. They aren't quite sure where, but uh, they want to see how, how well they get. The timeline for this is um, stretched because Hera, sorry, Desi is building the light source. They have the European light source. It is sucking in all the resources, and no other project gets resources until the light source is finished. It's not yet finished. It means the project is therefore delayed. So the schedule here uh, says spring of 2017. This is probably a year away. So they have an experiment where there are no magnets, just with the optics tables, et cetera, et cetera. That's probably delayed by a year. And then ELPS finished 2020 is probably now pushed to 2021 at this point. So third flagship experiments. 
Um, I'm not going to talk about Casper. This is very low energy axions. So rather than talk about the experiment, I'll talk about very low mass axions. So if the axion mass were too light, the usual folklore is you would overclose the universe in axions. As you make the axion lighter and lighter and lighter, you make more and more axions in the early universe. If you're willing to fine tune the axion physics, you can make that mass as low as you want. If you're willing to introduce, eventually, as, as we were talking about, you run into problems with baryogenesis, the scale of inflation, reheating temperature, blah, blah, blah. So you start running into real problems. If you're willing to inject new or different physics, you might be able to evade those problems. There are people who find that extremely attractive. I'm not one of them, but other people do. If you find that extremely attractive, there are experiments that are probing um, very low mass axions. By low mass, I mean I'm sniffing at 10 to the minus 20 EV, 10 to the minus 18 EV. Um, that said, because of the LIGO results, there's something called axion superradiance. So axions can get trapped near the event horizon of a black hole and affect the LIGO pulse. And those, believe it or not, I would have said there's no possible way you can put a bound on um, axions at such low masses, but LIGO is now putting out such, such results. And rather than talk about this, I will just say that LIGO is now coming out with these so-called axion superradiance results, and they are something to keep your eye on. Um, let me skip this. So, I've got several conclusions here. So sorry, I've violated the rule. You should have only one slide of conclusions. Um, here's the, an experimental scenario going forward. Um, I have clarity on the near term. I have less clarity 10 years out. So we'll talk about the near term technology. Um, here are the current laser experiments. So these are old Alps. GAMV, et cetera. Perhaps with locked Fabry Perot's, you'd be in this neighborhood here. I, I have to tell you that people in this community would argue with me and tell me I should push it down, but I'm not going to. Uh, I don't know how to push it down to get you into the realm here of QCD dark matter axions, but they claim there's a way. So if you ever get a talk from them, they will tell you the magic. Helioscope, solar axions. The current limits or bounds are in this neighborhood here. And in 10 years, perhaps, if CERN funds this, you might be seeing the helioscope. I could almost see a scenario where it cuts in to the QCD axion here. That, that, that might happen with solar axion. Um, the ADMX experiment is trolling this region here. And within a year, we will probably explore this region. It's well within the QCD dark matter axions. Um, our three-year program, it's now, by the way, a five-year program, given budgets, et cetera. Uh, but our program after that first year gets a little harder as the frequency goes up, covers this region here. It's the second decade of available mass between a micro and a milli V. There are three decades. We cover first one relatively quick, second decade a little slower, and third one really not at all. Um, so as I said, the third decade is quite challenging. Uh, conclusions two. Listen to nature is, I guess, my conclusion on conclusions two. The LHC and the WIMP detectors are Crucial. Um, I was surprised that LHC didn't find supersymmetry. I thought it was a 50% Bayesian prior. And I'm quite surprised. I'm also surprised the terrestrial WIMP detectors didn't see WIMP recoils. That surprised me a little. Um, so the jury is, and this is some old bounds from Atlas um, and CMS, which is Atlas. There's Atlas, there's CMS on God only knows. What is this? Bounds on 
called M. Sugra. So th this is embarrassing to the supersymmetry community. Um, but this has to do with the neutralino of the WIMP world. Uh, the jury's still out, but if you don't see Susie and WIMPs, um, you might want to look harder at axions. That, that's what I guess I'm saying here. Um, conclusions three is um, I just wanted to wrap up. The axions are a very compelling dark matter candidate. Um, the axion, the QCD, dark matter axion, QCD, dark matter axion, well bounded in mass and coupling. Um, the focus for axions is probably 100, 1 to 100 micro EV. Uh, you could imagine scenarios where it could go up more than that, and you can imagine scenarios it could be less than that, but that's sort of the sweet spot. There are many search technologies, but right now the RF cavity technique is the most sensitive. So ADMX, the axion dark matter experiment, is probably the, lar is the largest and most mature. Others are in development. Um, so next several years, we'll see discovery or reject the QCD dark matter axion hypothesis at reasonable confidence. Reasonable means that somebody could come back and say, well, yeah, it could be higher, it could be lower. If you don't see these things, that's the nature of it. Uh, the space of variant, once you get rid of the word QCD or dark matter, the space of axions and axion-like particles is wide open. So if you, if you remove their coupling to QCD and dark matter, there really is a whole space. And I don't know how, um, you know, an example of this, there's been a community of people who say, I will stick on an extra U1 symmetry to the standard model. So it's SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 cross U1 prime. That U1 prime has a new photon. It might have a mass. I don't know how compelling that is, but certain, certainly possible. No reason it couldn't happen. No particular bounds on it that eliminate it. Uh, so the space is wide open, and I would almost consider the Soli axion and the laser experiments to be in that category, although they would argue with me. Their ideas for searching for very low mass axions, enough said. But quite starkly, these experiments have the sensitivity and mass reach to either detect or rule out a, certainly a wide range of QCD dark matter axions at quite high confidence. Funding. We're mostly funded by the U.S. Department of Energy, High Energy Physics. Um, they're a joy. The Le Lawrence Livermore Lab has, still gives us LDRD money for this. They're very kind. And private, private foundation, the Heising Simons Foundation, has also supported this. So thank you very much. Very much. So I'm not the expert on that, but I can give you my twist on it. Usually anthropic arguments make me very, very, very queasy. Okay, they really do. But the axion is an unusual anthropic argument for two reasons. One is there's buried in this axion formalism is the theta angle of QCD. Okay, the prior of that angle can be anywhere from 0 to 2 pi. So here we have a parameter that you want to apply anthropic arguments to. The parameter, and we know it's prior. Okay. The second thing is you know what happens with changing that prior from one region to another region. Everything might go into black holes, or you might not get any structure. So it's an unusual anthropic argument because you know the prior and you know the physics repercussions of that prior. I, I don't know of any other anthropic argument that's as powerful, to, to, to be honest. Whether that gets it over the hump and turns it into a valid anthropic argument, I don't know. But it's a very important question because if you could apply anthropic arguments, then you can naturally go to very, very light axions if you were so inclined without that's your theory. So that's as far as I can go with that. So who are the experts on this? There was an early paper by David Kaplan and somebody and somebody on this. Wilczek also put out a paper on this. But I, I haven't gone through either of those. Are you confident that what are the biggest 
reliability for our experiment. Um, we are operating a deep cryogen experiment. We want to operate it with very, very high lifetime. Um, every pull out and recool cuts much into the lifetime. So the reliability requirement is very, very high. So that's the biggest challenge that we have probably in the experiment. It's not like a typical dilution refrigerator measurement in the laboratory where you cool it down, you take your measurements for a while, and then you let it warm up. We have to run for months. Yeah, yeah. So in a bad year, we have to do, we plan for three pullouts. In a good year, we plan for two. But, that, but that's our biggest challenge. A noise is a challenge. Doing the calibration of the noise temperature is absolutely crucial. We have to know how much excess noise is being developed in the experiment. And that has, as I said, a ladder of, um, calibrations that have to be done, but that's crucial to, to convert your null result into a sensitivity. So that's also a challenge. And also the quantum electronics is quite a challenge. I mean, this is kind of finicky. In the old days of transistor amplifiers, you turn on a switch and you're there. With quantum electronics, it's slightly tougher. You have a space of, at any tuning setting of the cavity on any et cetera, et cetera, you have two knobs you have to turn. You have a current bias through the device and you have a um, flux bias for the device and you have to tune all these things to optimize the signal to noise. Yeah, so there's a subtlety that is annoying. The, we had supernova 1987A, and if you remember that from 1987, it was a core collapse supernova in the LMC, and over tens of seconds, there were something like 10 neutrinos detected Earth. So overall, the overall view of this, this type 1A supernova was correct. The gravitational binding energy turned into neutrinos. The actual arrival time dis distribution of the neutrinos is not well matched to um, the expectation of the arrival time of the neutrinos. The overall number is fine. So since then, these 3D models of supernova explosions have gotten better and better and better, but still the biggest problem is not <laughs> Is, is that we don't yet have good models. If we had better models, we can constrain that a lot better. But yeah, more another explosion with our detector packages we have would be great. And then we would really have to double down on the mo modeling of this to, to really understand it. it. Hasn't been done well yet. You know, in fact, it's only recently they've gotten a supernova to explode with supernova codes. It's not that recent that they've gotten supernova to explode. That was a big advance, you know, 3D codes that actually exploded and didn't just pop, didn't just do nothing. Backgrounds, um, so we have an advantage that, say, a monopole search of Blas Cabrera didn't have. So Blas Cabrera set up a superconducting loop monitor the current of the loop, and then for three years he went off and drank beer, I presume. Then one day he came in and saw that there was a jump in the current consistent with a monomagnetic monopole traversing loop. Then he had to ask, what do I do now? It's been three years, I have a jump. Do I wait another three years or 10 years, or what do I do? Our experiment's radically different. We see backgrounds, so we will see transient backgrounds, et cetera. We don't know they're transient, we just see them in our spectrum. Uh, but they should always be there. It's not like a monopole search. You have to wait another three years. Uh, when we retune to that frequency and correct for Doppler motions, et cetera, that peak should always be there. So the way our experiment operates is we scan through some region, and we call it a nibble. Maybe it's 10 megahertz. Um, we collect candidates, and some are statistical and some are transient. We go back and look 
we drill down at those. And if it's real, you'll see it. If it's real, we'll see it. So the procedure is as follows. So your question becomes, what if we do this procedure and we think we've gotten rid of RF backgrounds, et cetera, and we keep seeing a persistent axion? Uh, thing one that we would do is um, we can retune the cavity so instead of the TM mode being at that frequency, we have the TE mode being at that frequency. Given that it, the axion has to convert to E and two photons, which are pseudoscalar, that's not a pseudoscalar. We shouldn't see it. If we see it, we ramp the field down. That we can do fairly easily. If the field ramps down, commensurate with the power develop, that's a good sign that it's a real axion. And thirdly, and I didn't mention this, the de Broglie wavelength of the axion is laboratory accessible. The units are meters, not nanometer and not light year. That means you can take two cavities, put them on top of each other, see that they're coherent, and then move them beyond the de Broglie wavelength and watch its development into incoherent. Just like a double slit experiment where you move across and you begin to see decoherence. So that's the chain we would have to go. We've never gone to the point where we actually have to um, even ramp the field, field down. Once, once we see it, we will go into radio silence, and we will study it like crazy, and in a very short time, we'll have an answer whether it's a persistent, true persistent candidate or spurious. It, it really isn't like a monopole search in that regard. Any other questions? Okay, thank the speaker again. Thank you.